it's time once again to step out, step up, and step into the Coming Out Lounge, a safe space to be you and your truth with Coming Out Coach Rick Clemens. Rick's expertise in the coming out process has helped hundreds of men and women ignite their inner desires to powerfully step out of the closet and into the light of living authentically as gays and lesbians. Freeing you from the feelings of guilt or shame, Rick offers take action tips for basking in the glow of self-love, easy to implement tools for wrapping yourself up in the warm embrace of self-acceptance, and take it to the bank advice on how to step courageously into a powerful, purpose-filled life on the other side of the closet doors. Each week, the Coming Out Lounge brings you heartwarming coming out stories, insights for living authentically as a gay or lesbian, and challenges you to step out of the ordinary and into your extraordinary life. Pull up a chair, cuddle up with the truth of who you've always been, and let's spend an hour in the Coming Out Lounge, discovering how to energetically step out, step up, and step into living your truth. Here's the host of your show, Coming Out Coach Rick. Hello, Closet Busters. It's time once again to stop the closet dwelling and to step out, step up, and step into living your truth. Welcome to the Coming Out Lounge. I'm your host, Rick Clemens, the Coming Out Coach. And I want you to give yourself some high fives today because today we are really going to step into truly being ourselves. For the first time in history over the last couple of years, we have seen a lot of shifts happening. And so today we're going to go take a little walk. In fact, we're going to go to the chapel, the courthouse, the beach, the secret garden, Really, wherever you want to go, get hitched and have your big gay wedding. Now that 37 states have stepped up to the equality plate by recognizing that gay marriage is pretty cool and people have a right to love who they love, and also with the big looming decision by the Supreme Court coming up, whether or not this will become a nationwide marriage equality country, it just seemed like to me a really, really great time to have some conversations about the ins and outs of planning your big gay marriage celebration. So here's what I've done. To help me out, I've engaged, no pun intended, my good friend Tanya Adlita, who is the owner of Arabella Events, to kind of help us sort through the beauty and the chaos that comes with planning your big walk down the aisle, or maybe it's a little walk down the aisle. So to really get this party started, I want you to please welcome to the show, not surprisingly, a gal who is a sucker for a great love story. Um, And she's also a coffee addict. In fact, she's named her dog Macchiato, go figure. And I also know she's a little bit of a workaholic, so we're going to get through this podcast really quickly so that her and I can both get back to doing all the other cool things we have to get done, especially for her because it's June wedding season. Welcome to the show, my friend, Tanya Adlita. Oh, thank you so much, Rick. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm so excited. You know, ever since we connected up, I thought, you know what? I really want to get somebody on the show to talk about this whole marriage, wedding planning sort of stuff, because I think it's really cool when we can go and do these super big celebrations of life and love, which is really what it's all about. So I know you have been in this business for quite a while. So um, why don't you just give us a little bit of background of how Arabella events came into being? Sure, I'd be happy to. I actually started my first planning company when I was a junior in college. I was that girl with the stack of wedding magazines that wasn't really seriously seeing anybody. Mm -hmm. I was just all into the idea of the weddings themselves. And I think that's just a a bit of how I grew up, just in a very hospitable nature. And we're always finding a reason to throw a party. Um, And Arabella is actually the name of my grandmother's great grandmother. I'm a bit of a genealogy nerd, and I inherited all the family letters. And I have this love letter that was written to Arabella in 1815, and I don't even know who the guy is. I haven't been able to find him in the tree uh, or, you know, any of these other family documents. But this letter meant enough to Arabella that it has passed down through generations now almost 200 years uh, at this point. So just that idea of the legacy of a love story and Mm -hmm. how important these connections are and the differences that our love makes not only within our own families, but, you know, for generations. And what we're seeing now, the idea of expanding that definition and and really being true in our definition of what love is and that equality and carrying that all the way through. It's just such an exciting time to to do what I do. I'm sure. And I love that you bring up the piece of the legacy of a love story because I know for a lot of people in my world who have been together for many, many, many years, who never thought they would see this beautiful day dawning where we who love who we love, regardless of sexual orientation or gender, 
can actually have these celebrations and say, I'm married and this is my husband or this is my wife outside of the scope of the traditional, this is my husband, this is my wife. I think it's so powerful to know that we are literally standing on the brink of a new way of being in life. And it is a legacy of love is what it really is truly all about. So I know you've gotten involved in some gay weddings um, recently. In fact, when we first connected, you were kind of doing some really cool stuff around that. So before we dive into the gay wedding stuff, I just want to kind of throw it out there because I was married to a woman. Yes, I was Mr. Quasi heterosexual there for a while. And I went through a, a big wedding. I mean, we had a big wedding. So what I really would like to have you kind of comment on, and I know each wedding is different because each bridezilla or groomzilla, <laughs> however we want to look at this, brings their own stuff to the event. But what are some of the just typical big challenges that most people face when they start to plan, here's our big wedding? What are some things that typically crop up across the board? Well, I think one of the, the easiest things to identify is the money question. That is number one because it informs every other decision that you make. So mm -hmm. it's that conversation of, okay, what's our budget? And what is it that we're trying to accomplish with the budget? So that is, that's a universal truth for weddings across the board, uh, regardless of any other factor. It's what's our budget? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? How do we make the most you know, bang for the buck, so to speak? Um, and that's really, I'd say, the number one question that, that you really need to have that conversation of, um, you know, kind of coming to the table, cards out, right. what's our plan? You know, that's interesting because we all have heard the phrase, well, I say we all. That's a big, huge generalization. But I think most of us have heard the thing of the thing that gets between couples the most is money and sex. And if you don't set the tone right from the very beginning, even before you walk down the aisle, you're already not communicating. And it, it's just tough, especially when, you know, suddenly then you start to look at the flowers and you look at the venues and, you know, all this stuff. And it becomes a thing that the bright, shiny objects take you places <laughs> you weren't really intending to go. So obviously money is that biggie thing. So anything else that seems to typically get in the way with a lot of people in planning their weddings? Well, I think the, the next piece to that is who has a voice at the table. Um, more often than not, when you're looking at kind of a, a traditional conversation, when you've got two people that are coming together to get married, it's not just these two people. It's also their families. And depending on you know what the situation is, sometimes we're seeing a lot more of our couples now, um, both same sex and, uh, and not, that they are actually carrying most of the burden of the wedding expenses on their own. Right. We do still see some parents that are contributing. So that's, you know, again, we go right back into the money conversation where it's both communication and money. Who yeah. all has a voice at the table? How strong is that voice? And for the couple themselves getting married, one of my favorite things is to really hone in for them specifically because oftentimes especially when you get into some really traditional roles, you can tap right into family drama very, very quickly where the, the individuals getting married don't have their own voice right. because the parents are the ones with the money and they're trying to make the decision. So it's a really uh, just a great responsibility and honor for me to kind of get in there and help navigate and really to help people be heard. You know, this navigation piece is so critical and it, it really aligns with the whole coming out process that, Having someone to truly help you navigate through what is going on during these bigger moments is key critical. And I know for a lot of people, they go, well, why would I use a wedding coordinator or whatever? Because you kind of need somebody that's that third party outside of the chaos that's going on to really help you navigate. And what you just said reminded me of a client of mine who is getting ready to get married. They're starting to work on their wedding. Their wedding's next year. And he and his partner are already having the interesting discussions about things. And one of the things that kind of came out of left field was his partner's father and mother are divorced. And interestingly enough, his partner's family is very supportive and willing to contribute to the wedding. For my client, the question is whether his parents are interested in contributing because they have a little bit different stance about his homosexuality. Mm -hmm. So we're already starting to get into interesting dynamics that, right. you know, when I listened to him say this, I said, so what is going on then between you and your partner? Is this going to cause a rift? Because if this is going to cause a rift that, well, my parents contributed and I said, you know, 
these is a perfect opportunity to start having the real conversations as a couple because this could become something that suddenly explodes in the midst of And I think that's, I love that you said that because that's exactly what, um, you know, a lot of times people will look and like, well, you you plan pretty events. Yeah, that's part of what I do. But really, it's about empowering communication and creating connection for other people to share. So there's a lot more that's going on beyond you know, timetables and load in schedules and, and which flower is which, there's a lot more about the interpersonal connection and really creating that space for people mm-hmm. to have those hard conversations. All right. Well, I have another client who ironically, again, not his parents, but his partner's parents um, are divorced, live on opposite sides of the country, and the wedding is happening very soon. And there's an explosion that is going to happen. I Mm. mean, they know it's going to happen. But nobody is willing to stop the explosion from happening. And what's about to happen is the father, who has remarried, has a four-year-old son that the mother has no idea about. Oh, boy. And I'm sitting here, you know, in my coach role going, okay, well, you're not supposed to judge. And you know, so I go to the point, and so how do you feel about that? And my client's like, I'm not sure how I feel about that because this is my day. This mm-hmm. is my celebration. And I said, so what do you think by you not knowing how you feel about it and not wanting to say something, what do you think you're contributing to this explosion happening? And it was really interesting for him to go navigate that. And I think this is what you're bringing up is it's not just a pretty event. <laughs> yes, that's right. a piece of it. But you standing as the event coordinator, the wedding coordinator, you kind of have your ears open to everything that's happening around you that maybe the couple doesn't have their ears open to. Does that make sense? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's not only the idea of, you know, I've I've done this for quite a while and I've got dozens and dozens of events and all of that, you know, the experience is helpful. That That's certainly one aspect of it, but it goes far beyond that. And it really is what's being said and what's not being said and what needs to be addressed to avoid those big explosions. Uh, And, you know, when the explosion happens, how do we minimize it and get everybody back on track and and really preserve those relationships? Because that's really what it's about. I mean, these weddings, it's not just the idea of, you know, the fairy tale. Mm -hmm. You're bringing together people to intertwine themselves and to create a legacy. That's messy. It's very (laughs) messy. It's beautiful, but it's messy. It's very messy. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that I know that as I've watched several of my own friends go through different, different levels of big celebrations, you know, for me and my husband, we just did a simple thing at the courthouse and came home and had like 50 some people over at the house that evening. It was no big deal, but yet even no big deal. There were still moments that's like, okay, really? We're like having this tension moment for what reason? It wasn't like, it wasn't like we were doing anything out of the ordinary. It was a typical party for us, but there were a few little moments that, you know, we were very much in a very tense place. So, What is something that you do? And I know this may like take you off guard, but I know you're pretty much on your foot sort of gal. What is something you do when you start to see one of those explosions starting to develop in the midst of everything? What is something you do to kind of help quell it? I am a big proponent of quick action and honest conversation. Mm -hmm. So my, my thought is more along the lines of if this is inevitable, what can we do to minimize the impact as quickly as possible or to divert the attention so that it doesn't have the same kind of momentum that it may have had it gone unchecked. Right. So so I, I am one that I would be much more inclined to rip the Band-Aid off and yeah. deal with that than the idea of, you know, oh, well, let's pretend that that doesn't exist. Um, you know, that, that really never goes well, especially when you're talking about live events, that we're going to mix alcohol. Let's go ahead and put that in the mix. I mean, we haven't even talked right. about, you know, Uncle So-and-so and how much alcohol he's consumed throughout the night. And that does, you know, that, that plays a part. So it's something to be aware of and to really think through. Yeah, yeah. So as you've been doing some some planning with some gay couples, is there some unique things that have shown up that as an event planner, you were kind of like, okay, now what do I do with this? And if so, what were some of those things? Sure. Um, I think 
most of the things that I've seen from my end really are consistent regardless of the orientation of the couples. But what I have found for the couples themselves, there are a couple of uh, just key points that are a little bit different. The first is actually the engagement process itself. In a traditional uh, you know, man and woman type of relationship, it's very stereotypical that the man would propose to the woman. Now, even then, we're starting to see women you know, proposing to their guys instead. But when you're looking at a same-sex couple, the, the question then becomes, you know, who's, who's asking whom? Right. And, you know, or is it a, a mutual thing and how are they planning that together? And so that's the, the really very first question of how are you getting engaged? Right. Right. <laughs> so there's that. Um, the next thing I think they, that our same-sex couples see a little bit differently is uh, the wardrobe. So again, in a very traditional uh, man and woman sense, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. The expectations are very clear. Um, but this is kind of the fun part about getting into uh, just weddings in general. We're really turning the expectations up on their side a bit, and it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So what this could mean in sense of wardrobe, maybe there's two dresses, maybe there's two tuxes, maybe there's the same tux but different ties. I mean, there's a thousand different combinations, but that's something that my same-sex same couples need to work through and have that conversation, look at all of their possibilities um, that wouldn't necessarily impact, you know, you know, another, another traditional couple. Absolutely. Well, and one of the things I know you and I talked about when we first started talking about having you on the podcast was, you know, this, this tradition versus breaking the rules. I think mm -hmm. so many people feel like, okay, well, we have to do it this way. Yet I know there's a lot of people who are like, it's my day. I'm going to do what I want to do and I'm going to do it my way, which often can lead to... <laughs> some of the big explosions, you know, because right. <laughs> mom or grandma, you know, whether it's same sex couple or not, I mean, I could go on and on about, you know, all the things I've seen in that world, but people have this concept of what a wedding's supposed to be. And then the moment that somebody doesn't do it quite that way, they don't know what to do with it. Right. You know, and, and that's I, where our traditions in one sense, the traditions can be very comforting. There can be uh, it just a, a commonality in that expectation that people find very comforting. Um, but what I've really enjoyed, I, I often say that my couples are those that were traditional with a twist. Yeah. We like a lot of the traditions, but we like to turn things up a little bit and make people, you know, kind of, we like surprising people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it makes it a lot of fun because then it gives us an opportunity to bring your own personality into it. And it's not a matter of just checking the boxes because this is the way it's always been done. It gives me a chance to really get to know the couples and then to incorporate those aspects of their personality into their celebration itself. So I'm going to go someplace that usually is the biggest controversy in all of this. And I think it probably is. And I know it was in my first marriage. It was a little bit of a controversy is the the religious piece of this whole thing so how do you help a couple navigate if at all this religious differences piece if it's two couples from different religions or now you know with the gay marriage stuff there's a whole you know religious piece that kind of always seems to show up what do you do in those realms when you got the two religious thing going on do you just kind of go with it and help them kind of find the common ground do you say time out that's not my forte you guys need to have this figured out before you come to me what do you do in that realm you know honestly i i really meet the couples wherever they are and again this is regardless of orientation it depends sometimes they'll come in and uh, we'll share you know a commonality in our faith or in our belief systems and so it's a very easy conversation because we already speak the same language right. and then there's other times where they'll come in and they said you know what we're really not religious at all but we really enjoy this particular piece of poetry or you know whatever they wherever they might be coming into this Right. That's where I'll meet them. So sometimes it's a question that we'll tackle head on, and sometimes it's a bit of a non-issue. If they are already on the same page, then it's really just up to me to find an efficient who will match well with them and will really create the ceremony that they that they love and is so memorable for them. So that it's not it's not as bad as you might think. Right. So you know, since we're in this kind of realm of you know religion and all this, with Indiana having put forth the Religion Freedom Act and everything, it's obviously put up a lot of controversy around, okay, gay marriage and how do we as, you know, business owners and everybody interact. And I'm just curious as someone who's supporting, you know, gay marriage as much as traditional marriage, have you yet encountered any stigma or, you know, anybody that said, we don't want to do business with you if you're supporting gay marriage? 
Fortunately, I haven't, not in a professional sense. In a personal sense, I have had a couple of uh, difficult conversations with people. And when it comes down to it, uh, just to you know share my own philosophy, just to be really specific, I like to boil it down to pretty much love God and love people. Mm-hmm. And that is, that's pretty much the way that I am applying myself in this. And it doesn't matter what I'm doing. That's my goal. I'm just going to love God and love people. And I'm going to do really kick-ass work. Like that, that's the extent of my, my philosophy here. So having said that, um, for me personally, you know, there've been a few, few difficult conversations. I've got some people in my world, um, uh, that, that don't necessarily share my beliefs. Yeah. Um, but on a professional side, there is such a loving, loving network. Um, and I think that this is actually something I, I'd love to share with your listeners. When you're looking at hiring your wedding professional team, one of the first things that I'd really encourage you to do is have an open conversation with those professionals you're considering. And you will know immediately, based on the verbiage they're using, whether they are truly comfortable or if they're just trying to be PC yeah. or if they're really just not a good fit for you at all. You'll know as soon as they open their mouths and as soon as you start that conversation. Right. You know, and I agree a hundred percent because it could be that somebody will work with you just to work with you, just to get the business. And I would find that really unethical personally for somebody to do that. But some people will, and some people will kind of begrudgingly set aside their, you know, beliefs and go, this is what I'm doing, which then leads to the question, okay, then does that become discrimination if they say, I can't do that? You know, we could go, I could spend hours with that one. It's like, it's that, right. it is that big gray area right now. It is. And it's a bit of a catch 22 for the business owners because, you know, as well, as a business owner myself, it's that idea of, I want to completely stand behind everything that I do. Yeah. I'm very fortunate that I have an, an open mind and an open perspective and, and I'm just all about love and all about the love story. So for me, it's a really clear cut, easy way can I love you? Right. And am I available on your date? And can we make magic happen? Okay, there we go. That's all yeah. I need. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think it, it is that thing as a business owner because as this began to unfold, and I come from a fairly religious family, the one thing I always stand in in my own belief systems is that I want everyone to be able to just be who they are. Mm-hmm. But on the flip side of that, if that just being who you are hurts someone else, then I can't really stand behind that. However, if just being who you are enables you to honor your own integrity and your own value system, I'm fully supportive of that. So that's where the gray area starts to show up. I don't want to see a business owner be, you know, quote, persecuted as some would like to say, oh, because of my religious beliefs, now I'm being persecuted because I have to serve those people. Well, you're not really because you can find other ways to say, you know what, I don't think this is going to work out. I mean, I know for me as a coach, There are oftentimes that I get people coming through my doorway. We do a consultation and I don't have to even be five minutes into it or 10 minutes into it. And I'm, I'm, you know, I don't want to be judgmental, but I'm just feeling like it's not a good fit. Right. So rather than try to make it work just to make it work, I find ways to say, you know what? I'm not sure I'm the best fit for you. However, I do know these people that would probably be a really good fit for you. And here's why. And, you know, when somebody says, why don't you feel I'm a good fit? I'm kind of like you. I'm very forthright. I just, this is why, you know, and I say it, but it comes down to that. Somebody could say, well, you're discriminating against me because I'm not gay or lesbian. No, my site may seem very gay or lesbian oriented, but I work with people from all walks of life. If I'm choosing not to work with you, I'm choosing not to work with you out of integrity because I don't know that I'm the best fit, plain and simple. Exactly. So, so. I know that, you know, a lot of stuff comes up in weddings and a lot of jitters start to show up. Um, What is something that you would say to someone who, you know, the big day is here and here we are, it's starting to happen. What is something that you would really encourage your client to just tap into to really get themselves through that big day? Mm, That's a great question. Actually, I start, believe it or not, in the very first conversation in our consultation with some visualization exercises. Mm-hmm. And for me, it's, it's incredibly important to really tap into what the true desires are. Because a lot of times uh, there is a tendency, especially within wedding planning, there's so much expectation about, especially as some of my, my gay couples have told me this, there, there's so much pressure for this big, fabulous gay wedding 
that they really feel like they've got to live up to all of these, you know, societal things. Um, and that's really just not who they are as a couple. So to really take that time at this very beginning and tap into, okay, who are you as a person? Who are you as a couple? What do we want to create by bringing your closest friends and family together? And then from there, we're building upon that very core foundation truth. So then to answer your question, then when it comes to the day of itself, we have so much depth that we have then created that they're really, they're standing on their own foundation that we've built together. So I won't go so far as to say that, you know, my couples don't get nervous, of right, course right. they do. But I think we're, we've got such a strong connection and we're really able to tap in very quickly to what this is really all about because it's not about the, the extraneous things. It's about that connection. It's about the commitment and it's about the celebration. Yeah, no, I agree a hundred percent because I think when you come from that authentic place of what it is you desire and what you want to have happen for you in this event, then you're doing exactly what's in alignment with who you are. It's exactly. the easiest way to be genuine. And, you know, when I was talking to this with my clients, my two clients that are getting married, there's a little bit of, you know, well, we're doing this, but it's not really who I am. I'm like, then why are you allowing it to happen? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that, you know, if you're doing it, it's not really who you are by the time you get to the day, you know, and for both of them, you know, I first conversation I had with one of them was like probably six months ago. The other one, obviously, we're a year out and this stuff's starting to show up. And I use the, you know, the explosion metaphor. Of, by the time you get there, the bomb's going to be ticking at a very high decibel. Right. And all it's going to take is one person to say one thing that may be around that thing. And the last thing I believe you don't want to say on your wedding day is, well, I was never in alignment with this or this was never my idea to begin with because there's the explosion. Right. Suddenly... It's happened and it came out because you were emotionally charged. A wedding day is emotional to begin with. So I just, I think this is interesting that you do the visualization thing with them so they can actually kind of see and get quickly into alignment with who they are. Exactly. Because when you're, when you're out of alignment, especially for something as emotionally triggered as your wedding, at that point, it opens the door for uh, disenchantment and um, yeah resentment for so many negative impacts they really I mean you're talking about starting your life together this is the official piece that then you know really formalizes your relationship so into that uh, you know old fairy tale idea of what a wedding is supposed to indicate that's not where you want to be starting off on the wrong foot <laughs> mm -hmm. absolutely no I agree and you know I have a friend who just went through this and um I remember at the end of the ceremony, I said, so how was that? And she said, you know what? It's great. It just wasn't what I wanted. Mm. And so I didn't go any further with her on that. I just kind of like, okay, let's let that go because I, this isn't the time or place to have that conversation. And about two months later, we had a chance to just chat about it. And she goes, you know, the thing I'm most disappointed in is I did so much of my wedding for everybody else and not for mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. And we all have heard the term, the happiest day of your life, all that sort of stuff. It's kind of <laughs> like showing up to Disneyland, the happiest place on earth and you have a really crappy day, you know, right? <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of those things that just, it's, it, if you can step into being who you are, I mean, especially for my gay and lesbian couples, you know, this is the coming out lounge. It's about truthfully standing in your most authentic self why would you trade your most authentic self in a moment that, you know, has been fought for for so long to be able to marry the person you really are in love with and trade that for being inauthentic in other ways just to make others happy? Even if mom and dad are contributing some money, even if, you know, somebody wants something specifically and that's not who you are, why would you do that? You know, right. Because it's in the end, you've actually set yourself up for a little bit of discontent and failure, quite honestly. So. I agree. And, and it's not to say that there, there isn't any room for compromise. I mean, we're not trying to say that there's this idea of it's my way or the highway. Because right. we don't need any bridezillas or groomzillas. Like, no. I, I, I really don't even work with that type of a personality. So yeah. we're open for compromise. But I think really what we're both saying is know yourself and be strong in who you are and know that there is so much love there to celebrate. And that's really what we want to build this on. 
Right. And love is love. And that's so much about the celebration is celebrating the love piece of this. And I think do it your way. That's the whole point. If you came out of the closet because you needed to be who you were and you were going to do that your way, you continue this pathway to just continuing to be in your most authentic self and not allowing any of this other stuff to show up. So I find it interesting. We just got a couple of minutes left here, but what I find so interesting is, is how you said, I won't work with those kind of people. So I'm curious, how do you skirt around that issue of, you know, if they're not somebody I really want to work with, how do you find yourself getting out of those spaces? Honestly, it's something I've developed over several years worth of finding the, that exact right fit, those clients that I will bend over backwards for, and I can't wait for them to come home from their honeymoon so we can catch up and go have coffee, and right. I get the baby announcements, and you know, that, that client, yeah. uh, the more that I get to spend time with them, I can very quickly figure out who is not in that same mold. Got it. And so I'm, I'm able to, uh, to determine that pretty quickly within the very first conversation, and kind of like what you said earlier, I just don't feel like we're going to be a good fit for you, but here's some other colleagues that might, might be better mm -hmm. for you. Yeah. And I think this is important. The reason I asked Tanya that question is because I think it's important as a couple to be able to also say to the event planner, the wedding planner, you know what? I'm not sure this is a good fit. I think right. most professionals in this world, because I used to be in that world, I was a hospitality manager for hotels and stuff. I got very accustomed to, you know, clients coming in and going, you know, I'm not sure this is the best property for us. Okay, no harm, no foul, because I want that to be the fit. And if it's not, we're both doing each other a disservice by trying to make this work. Absolutely. And I know we're just about out of time, but if you don't mind, if I no, tag on yeah. to that, uh, I have told my clients this probably ad nauseum, uh, but there are three people that I want you to really love in your wedding planning. Uh, your first is your photographer, and second is your filmmaker, because they're going to be capturing you all throughout the course of your wedding day. So I want you to be really comfortable with them because they're going to be with you. When you turn around and look back at these pictures and at these videos, I want you to be able to see yourself in your best form. And just if you don't like your photographer, it's going to show up in your face. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to yeah. show up in your pictures. And then your third person that you need to love, frankly, it's me. Yeah. It's your wedding planner. It's the person who's going to be with you throughout the entire process. And then, of course, the day of itself. So pay attention to specifically to those three, uh, you know, key, key components to your wedding planning. That's so cool. So this is the Coming Out Lounge, Tanya. It's the place where I really try to give people a place to explore who they are in their self, in their sexual self, in their orientation, to find bits and pieces of moving forward. I think today is like a biggie that we're actually able to have these kind of conversations. Go, oh, wow, so now we're talking about getting married and all this sort of stuff. But one of the questions I always ask at the end of the podcast is, you know, a lot of people are listening here trying to find their way. I know you're not lesbian and you know you you do your stuff your way but as someone who's gone through a lot of stuff in your own life if you were to give someone a piece of advice about just coming out coming out to be who they are coming out of a really chaotic thing in their life what would be a piece of advice you'd love to leave the listeners with mm. oh that's such a good question and uh, just for a point of transparency I am the twice divorced wedding planner. Mm. So that in and of itself should, should tell you, um, you know, while I, I might not have the same experience, um, there are certainly a lot of similarities and I have really had to come back to who I am and to be able to stand in my own voice and the strength of my voice and to act accordingly. So there's a lot that I can really identify with. And I would say probably my number one piece is, uh, it's a balance between solitude and support. I needed to step back away from the drama for me to really find my center again. And then I needed to be able to rely on just two or three people that I could open myself up to and say, this is where I am and this is what I need to do. So it's that balance of being able to pull back and to get your strength, but then also to, to remain connected uh, to those that can really be with you in that process. That's awesome. I love the solitude and support because that lines exactly up with when I'm coaching someone coming through the closet doors or coaching someone through going through a divorce or anything. I, I almost have to beg them at first to get really quiet with themselves okay. Okay. and secondarily to outside of the realm of my coaching and everything to also make sure they get some support wherever they need that support. So 
you hit a home run with that advice. I love it <laughs> that you brought it up that way. So really quickly, um, why don't you tell the listeners what your web address is? Absolutely. I'd be happy to. It is ArabellaEvents.com, and that is A-R-I-B-E-L-L-A. And we're on Wedding Wire, we're on Facebook and YouTube and Pinterest and pretty much any social media, you'll find us at Arabella Events. Awesome. And we'll have all that stuff up on the show notes for this show. And I just want to say thank you so much, Tanya, for being here, sharing yourself and really giving the listeners some inside scoop of the wedding event planning and what to do to make sure you have one of the most beautiful celebrations in your life besides coming out of the closet. So really appreciate (laughs) you being here. Thank you so much. It's absolutely my pleasure. And I want to just encourage our listeners, if you've gotten something out of this show, if you've really enjoyed it, got some ideas about what you want to do with your big gay wedding, go on over to iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud. Give us a little bit of love. We'd like lots and lots of love because that's what this show is definitely all about is love. And if you want to stay in touch with me, hop into Facebook, look for The Coming Out Coach. We'll get you connected to our online family over there at Facebook. And finally, if you're one of those little white doves that likes to tweet, 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 you can tweet about this show at Rick Clemens, and the hashtag is The Coming Out Lounge. And as you know, if you've been a listener, it's always time to make sure you step out, step up, and step into living your most powerful truth each and every day. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Till next time, have a wonderful day, and we'll catch you soon. Thank you for joining us today with the Coming Out Lounge with your host, Rick Clements. Make sure you tune in with us next week, same time, same place, for the Coming Out Lounge. 